The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMD's Alpha Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too and there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world of investment choice that goes beyond borders. Open up a world of investment opportunity with NetWealth, where you can access local and international securities, as well as bonds and foreign currency options for wholesale clients. Offer your clients flexibility, transparency, and efficiency with managed accounts, managed funds, and access to non-custodial assets. A world of investment awaits you. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantidis and the guest joining me here today to deep dive into Impactor was a finance journalist with the Australian Financial Review, Channel 9's Financial Review Sunday program, Kaplan Professional and the ABC and is author of the Financy Women's Index. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Bianca Archie Hazelman. Woo! Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Lovely to be here. Thank you for that intro. It's lovely. Not at all. Now, I am super keen to dive into all things Impactor, but first, uh, our audience know we start with the the easy breezy getting to know you and how you use technology. So yeah. let's kick off with, what's your most used emoji? Do you even use emojis? I do. I use. I mean, I have a couple really. I <laughs> and I know you've asked for one, so my preference is the wink. I oh, really nice. like the wink. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's got some personality, right? It has a bit of personality. It's kind of like saying, yeah, I get it. I'll be there. Rain late. We'll be uh, Yeah, I like the wing. <laughs> Perfect. And we all are so attached to our sp- smartphones. How did we ever organize anything in our lives without them? If you had to wipe all the af- apps off your smartphone, what would be the three that you'd keep? Oh, this is a good one. I'd keep what I use and what makes my life easiest. Mm-hmm. I, I keep the Woolies app <laughs> because I'm one of those people. I don't shop. I I'm, I I literally do my food groceries and get the get them delivered while I'm laying in bed. You have all that kind of organised, so I need yep. that always ready to go when we're running out of stuff. Um, definitely keep the camera because I'm always snapping. I've got three little girls. We're always snapping pictures and using that, and I'm always looking at LinkedIn. <laughs> nice. I love it. Look, and I love to hear of somebody else who avoids shops, food and other shops at all costs. I'm the same. If you can get it delivered, that's how I do it. Yeah. It's um, just right. make everything is when you're running a business, it's all of the other stuff. Yeah. Don't just that you have to do that. Yeah. I'm not financial to the point yet where I can hire somebody to do that. <laughs> right. But it's on the list. I'm the and same. And it's on the list. It's on the list. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. So let's dive. Thank you for that. Let's dive into Impactor, shall we? So to give uh, the listener a sense, let's sort of go really high level and talk about where it sits in the tech space. This is broader than advice tech, clearly. Um, yep. But talk about, you know, sort of what category does the tool fit in? And then let's also talk about sort of, you know, how it came about, why why you developed the app. Yeah. Well, Impactor is, what category is it? It sits in the diversity, equity, and inclusion category. So the DEI yeah. software space. Yeah. Um, and that has traditionally been a place of HR software. But right. what we're seeing with HR software is more DEI being a bolt-on to your existing platform or, a, you know, there might be an, a further integration Impactor is a, um, a centralized self-assessment platform that allows you to measure and track 
your DEI performance in real time and then get actions for your performance, whether you're underperforming or overperforming, um, will provide solutions to how to do better. And the critical to what we're doing is being able to validate through our accountability layers how well a company is actually doing by asking the employees are they feeling it? Are they? Is this company delivering on things like the gender pay gap or leadership diversity across many broad forms? Are they delivering on flexible work or, you know, parental leave? All these different strategies, um, different things that might be in place. And finally, the other thing Impactor does is really look at the business case for change. So we are an MVP, but we've started our product by looking at. Um, the financials of a company and then correlating that with how that organization might perform relative to their DEI initiatives and in time to their gender pay gap, to their leadership structure, different things like that, to try to break down this thinking that there is not much of a correlation between DEI performance when there really is, and they're increasingly, we're seeing the research that is showing it, the more companies um, are tracking it, the more we're able to say, aha, uh-huh, it's there, it exists. Um, so we're, we've built that into the software as well. And look, I think it's such an interesting conversation because I'm with you for, look, decades there's been all this conversation about business case to justify things like this. And what's interesting to me about that now is companies are spending a fortune on employee wellness, right, on all sorts of programs that are about both engaging their employees but but ensuring they're, you know, the best versions of themselves. Mm. Surely the environment they're working within is a significant part of that and therefore – and to me, that's part of what DEI represents is the the environment, the vibe, the interaction, the way, the leadership, how all of that works is a contributor and an ongoing contributor to an employee's individual well-being. So to, so to me, Definitely. it's natural that we would want to be on top of this if we want to retain great people. Absolutely. It is about employee retention and it's about attracting the right people as well to your workforce. And we are in a place, space and time now where if an organization's not performing, it will soon be known and there are many websites that do, you know, even social media that do allow for uh, this kind of naming and shaming or it gets around if you're not really yeah. living up to what you say you are doing and if you're merely pink washing or DEI washing or, you know, <laughs> yeah. and that's a green washing. Yes. Um, these things are increasingly on the radar of employees. Um, yeah. So it is in a, a, a business's best interest to invest in DEI. Now, not all DEI initiatives are relevant to that particular organization. So it's a matter of, of looking at what might be. Um, but that's the beauty, I suppose, of our self-assessment tool. It's kind of, it, make, it takes the guesswork out of a lot of, you know, where do I start? What do I do? Yeah. Oh, God, there's too much to think about here with DEI. What next, yeah. you know? Ah, so, yeah. So we've tried to we've worked closely with the University of South Australia Center of Workplace Excellence to develop an evidence based approach, um, and it is comprehensive. It is robust. There's no getting away from that. But if you commit to this, and you can see the outcomes through positive performance or effectiveness DEI, then without a doubt you should see, as you have just said, those correlations with employee retention. Um, being able to say, hey, we stand for this and attract um, staff to your organization. And I think it's one of those chicken before egg things. You know, many organizations say, you know, we want to attract diverse candidates, but how do we attract them? Well, you know, you've got to be on the pathway to show that you are actually wanting to make change at the same time. Yeah. And look, I can see this um this, well, it's impact, right? So, of course, it's going to have impact, but I can see it having impact in a much broader sense. You know, in financial advice, one of the biggest waves that's that's approaching us is the huge intergenerational wealth transfer that's going to occur. And that is going to end up per annum being bigger than super contributions per annum, right? This is going to be a massive financial shift of money. And the reason I bring that up is, you know, one in four Aussies are born overseas and one in two have an overseas born parents. So even just from, you know, from that sort of diversity and inclusion perspective, having an approach that understands different 
whatever different is and understands the variety of people that contribute both in your business but also your client base. Like all of this to me will make us better advisors, right? This is all about putting yourself, having the ability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Now, of course, gender is a huge part of that. That's, you know, just over 50% of consumers. But there's so many other layers of this we need to, you know, understand and start making habits, you know, like these business habits that just mean that our businesses better reflect the public. Mm. Hey, it's a really good point. And um, I was I was reading something um, that Simon Sinek said the other day about customers. Um, customers will never love a company until the employees love it first. And yeah. that is a quote that really resonates with me. And I think about that with financial advice because I've, I've been a journalist for some time following financial advice and financial services industry. Mm. And it really is important to truly understand the client, to truly understand what your customers want. Um, you 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 have to see it also in your own workforce to understand yeah. the different ideas. And diversity isn't just about the physical; it's about the ideas, it's about the approach to work, the thinking, the way, the cultural background, the influences, all these different things. Um, it's not a matter of just having you know a, a various people of different skins, nationalities in your workplace. It's a it's a whole wonderful recipe of ideas that can hopefully allow you to understand and attract clients to your business. Yeah. And look, where, I mean, where we're where we're going there is is true diversity of thought or ideas. You know, that's where you get. Well, that's where the magic happens when we see a, a solution out there, and we're just like, "Wow, that was amazing." Often that's because they've truly gone wide in terms of the way they look at or think about something. That's only possible when not everybody is like us, me, whoever you are, like whatever your business looks like, you only get that sort of really innovative and and interesting and dynamic environments when there is diversity. And that's of all, and, and of course that comes from different lived experiences and different lived experiences come from different ethnic backgrounds, gender, you know, uh, age, you know, physical ability, all sorts of things contribute to those different lived experiences. So, um, yeah, I'm right there with you. I think it can be so easy to say, oh, but I don't think there's an issue. Everybody gets the same opportunity, don't they? It's like, well, that's only coming from your own lived experience. You know, what's required here is to be able to step outside your own shoes and into somebody else's. Mm, Absolutely. And I think this is where Reverse mentoring can be quite powerful is understanding, where, you know, where it's available, where you can do that, is understanding and stepping into the shoes of, of somebody else. And, and you know, I, I'm throwing that out there, which I'm sure is coming at a time of increased cost pressure. And there is this consideration at the moment, can I afford to spend on DEI? Can I afford to invest in all these different things? And it's it's really critical to the long-term viability of businesses today to be doing something about this Um, because the, you know, it's the being in this game of business is something that can be purposeful and long-lasting rather than so short-term focused and just getting in, getting out kind of thing. It really can have a greater impact and that is the wonderful power of business and I suppose advice as well. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So let's let's talk about um, the user experience um, for Impactor. So, I mean, it, it's clear that there's a leadership, um, you know, engagement with the tool. But over what layers of say, and let's let's talk a small to medium business initially. But clearly, it's it's designed also for for bigger business. But sort of what layers of the business can interact with the tool, and and what experience do they have as they do that? Sure. So any organisation with five or more employees can use Impactor. Um, mm-hmm. We've deliberately done that because DEI shouldn't be something that you reach a certain size and say, "Oh, have, suddenly I care." <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it really yep. is something that we shouldn't we shouldn't price smaller companies out of purpose. No. Um, and so that's why we've done that and, and staged a few different things differently there. But it's it's about having the business owner involved or the CEO. Um, and then if you have it, an HR team would predominantly, th- those three types would do the initial steps. Yep. You might also involve your finance department for those financials, different things like that. Um, but certainly small, medium and large, I think where we sit and we are early days, we've only just launched this product. Mm. Um, I see us being of most appeal and certainly the companies on the platform tend to be medium to large. 
Yep. I do hope, though, that um, our product will appeal to small. And so we've got some other bits of functionality that will come out as we grow um, because that it's important. It's important for the, the bigger impact as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so then, so the, you know, leadership team will be doing that. And I'm imagining that's part of that self-assessment process and sort of really yes. taking those first steps. You then talked about um, getting feedback from the staff. How does that work? How often does that normally happen? Like, what are you expecting that that's going to happen as, as you know, businesses use the tool? Sure. Well, the the beauty of the tool is we take quarterly data snapshots, whether you're using it every quarter or not. And the purpose of that is for historical tracking. So we want to see ideally that um, an organization is improving over time and to give you the data back to have a look at where or not improvements were made. So you, that really resonates. Now, how often a company comes in and does the updates is completely up to them. They might introduce a new strategy. They might you know, cull half their workforce. Yeah, There are things that, that will need to be updated if those kind of um, situations arise. So with quarterly um, data snapshots, we'd say surveying your employees no more than once a quarter. Some organizations will do just once a year. And it's really about having that bounce back on the latest picture of the workplace and the strategies in place. So we ask a lot about those equitable strategies around superannuation, flexible work, paid parental leaves, leadership development, pay equity, different things like that. So there might be changes that might warrant an organizational leader to say, right, it's time for us to survey again. Or indeed, the organization might say, let's survey, like I know some companies do, twice a year to really get a sense. Or that organization might have not performed very well at at the very outset and is on a mission to correct that result. So it's really up to the company and to the the goals they want to set themselves and how quickly they want to get there. But the DEI um, process is, is a long-term commitment. It's not something you suddenly get your score and you're there and you've ticked all the boxes because <laughs> anything can change. And it's about culturally setting the organization to ensure that you have that constant check-in um, with your workplace to make sure that they still feel that it, they belong. Right. And it's that, um, it's interesting, it's the type of health check that advisors do repeatedly with clients, but it's almost like a, a workforce mental health check. This is this is going, hey, how do you feel? And how do you feel about the space we've put in place for you? That's so I right. think is it you know, what a wonderful rigor to bring in. That's right. Absolutely. How effective is it? Um, could it be better? What What's not great about it? You know, tell us tell us more. And we've tried very hard to ensure that the way we ask the questions are not leading um, yeah. because there is uh, there are a lot of surveys that are biased in the way they approach the questionnaires. Um, we've tried very hard to ensure that that's not the case with the way the academics have framed things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I think, um, you know, it's interesting with this sort of tool, I can imagine some people or some businesses sort of going, you know, the minute we measure something, then uh, yeah. it's real. We're out there. It's real. Right. You know, this is, you know, but that's the point. This is not something that gets better when it's underserved. Like when it's being ignored, it doesn't get sure. better. It gets worse. It's like um, OHNF. So you've, if you, we can, we yeah. could continue to ignore that to, up until such a point that um, the you know, person on the work site keeps falling in the same hole. Like, yes, we we do need to think about DEI as a constant, as something that does need framework around it to continuously support the employee. And I get that there is, and there is this resistance because, in many ways, for a lot of organisations, um, they're still getting their head around DEI. Still, I mean, there's there's data out of the US is showing that. DEI recruitment for that diversity inclusion manager is among the fastest growing job types. So we know that organizations are hungry to make change where they can, um, but there still is this a bit of resistance around, you know, once we put ourselves out there, we're out there. But the reality is we live in a day where if you don't do something, the risk is somebody else is going to say something about it if you're not. Because we can't, we can't. We cannot be blind to the fact that employees aren't aware that all this is happening. Absolutely. And look, it's um, 
financial services is is way down the list in terms of all of the measures you might put in that as a general industry it's it's particularly bad on these fronts and so you know saying oh gee now's not the time i think is like well it it was the time years and years ago we're behind it's not like we're along the side other industries we're way behind um and so if we truly believe we want to connect with the public and help them this is part of that you know yeah. this is part of that mission <laughs> and there is an opportunity for an organisation to be the leader of diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, and, you know, I'd love to see that realised with financial services, you know, certainly. I mean, there is there is a lot of work to do. Absolutely. But progress, Abs- if, absolutely. If, if done right, is worth celebrating. Yeah, it is. And particularly, I mean, as advisors, we're really conscious of greenwashing and other things that have gone on yep. with investment funds, right? And so that's a real thing we see all the time. The, this is an issue within financial services companies is a similar issue. There's a lot of talk about it. They've even maybe got awards or things that like there's all this stuff that looks great on a PR release, you know, on a press release. But the actual measure internally of how this is going and how it's changed over time is the best demonstration of of impact and and having a making a real difference. So I think you know if a if a corporate doesn't doesn't have a tool like this, you've got to question. Well, what what are they doing? Mm. And that's what's great about Impactor is you can use this information and your progress to tell that story to your customers in PR in marketing activities, both internal and external. You know, we do have a uh, a couple of financial advisory businesses on the the, the platform, um, and I know they're very active about how they're progressing yeah. and wanting to use Impactor as a way to say we've validated it, we've checked it, this is how we're going. Absolutely, because progress is the truth, right? I mean, I think. If if we if any corporate or any any even small advice business came out and said no we've got it covered it's all good, well the public's going to instantly suspect that because it's not possible we can't all be perfect at, at something like this because it's so relatively new, so demonstrating progress that's what shows that you're on it is that you're making efforts. Yeah, that's right, and I think um in this environment there is a real risk of you mentioned greenwashing before the the regulator has put businesses on notice for that. Um, and investors are kind of looking out for it. So yeah. we, we do have to be aware of, of what's of what's happening in the lands yeah. of compliance. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so in terms of then, you know, what's what you're seeing down the track, you mentioned a few things that you guys are going to be adding. Is there, you know, what are the next sort of milestones um, for the app? What are you working towards or, or going to expand and develop it? Sure. To, you know, what what's the next phase? What we're looking at n- – and what we're developing are more customization tools around tracking individual DEI initiatives that are okay. outside of the self-assessment yeah. um, and then goal tracking assignments to that. There's also an integration allowing for our uploads to go through to Wajia and, and vice versa to reduce okay. the fatigue on gender equity questions because that's a big thing. You want to be able to measure and track ongoing performance around gender equity you don't want to lose it or be in a mad scramble when it comes time to report to a GIA, which tends yeah. to happen. Um, so this is a way to make that easier in an ongoing um, environment. So, I mean, they're just a couple of the, the things that I've said quite easily, but the actual development <laughs> of <that> is, just, <laughs> is really something that's um, entertaining to say the least at this point in time. I mean, my background is a, as a finance journalist, so – um, and when I produce the women's index, it's all around writing about the data and the findings. So the purpose in creating Impactor was to help organisations take action towards the big picture equality and reduce those timeframes. Yeah. Um, and so I've had to team up with tech experts um, from financial services, from um, different fintech and um, out various technology companies to bring impact it to life. And it has been a, um, from a designer point of view, a real eye opener for me, you know, and there's so much more that you can, that's exciting me when I look at the tech world around AI and how we can use that with impact and all these different things that are very exciting 
at this point in time. I think I saw an article around Microsoft this morning saying that that AI contributed a significant portion to a record profit for the company. And that's just the appetite for yeah. this type of tech at this point in time and where we're going into the future with with um, not just technology but our own services jobs. Absolutely. It is it is both exciting and sort of it's it's actually a bit you, you've got to pause sometimes and just think, yeah. how is this possible? I'm living in the movies that <laughs> yeah, came out a decade ago. This is just yeah. nuts, but it's it is fast, exciting. It? And and I think very fast, very fast. And I think it's it's um what I love is, you know, tech was always going to be used for things like analysis and, and tools like that. Like we, you know, financial yeah. advice, it's all forecasting. What I love yeah. is some of this tech now doing things like what you're doing here. Like this is, you know, human impact stuff. That's exciting. When we can start to use the tech for those sort of things, um, you yeah. know, then it's it's amplifying the impact we can all have as individuals. That's really exciting. Um, yeah. Okay, so it's early days. It's your only how, – how long has it been – been it's released. been a month. It's been a month. <laughs> Woo-hoo, <laughs> it's been that month. Super exciting. Yeah. It feels like an age, but it's been a month. It's because you've been in we well, development doesn't start stop, does it? You just launch. No. No. And then you just keep going. You just keep developing and you're selling and you're you're talking about it and suddenly all advocacy work really is is selling and advocacy work. And it's and it's it's a challenge when you're a startup as well because not many people ever want to be first, but often yeah. those that are are rewarded for being first. So it's it, it and it is an education around it as well. But um, I love this kind of work. I absolutely thrive in this environment and talking about these products and learning all the time. It's like doing a, a an MBA on steroids or something like that. You're constantly learning, and it's 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 a thrill for me. It's it's fabulous, and I think um, you know we all have tried new things and and discovered the wonder. And I'm imagining the 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 tool is only going to grow and amplify by the more people using it. You guys need people to start interacting with it, different types of businesses, different approaches, different strategies. Absolutely, it's critical right. for the benchmarking across the platform. It's critical for the insights that even me as a journalist is able to write, but also. Our partnership with the University of South Australia now Adelaide, that um, which with that merger going ahead, um, is is huge because we're able to inform the academic community as well uh, at an aggregated level um, about what it takes to be a top performer in yeah. this country, and that is really groundbreaking stuff for the future of DEI. Absolutely. Absolutely, because it can't. It it just simply can't be one of those sort of motherhood, you know, bumper sticker statements made anymore. We are so far beyond that. Um, this is all about action now, and so you know, being able to give them data that truly demonstrates the impact that action can have or mm. not have. You know, if if we don't take any, I think that's how you'll actually get movement on things. Because in any business, you know, there's priorities, and we've just got to try and nudge this up the priority list. You know, That's right. people be paying more attention in a general sense to these sort of topics so that it just becomes part of the DNA. You know, That's it should right. just be and another I mean, part of things I, that automatically I happen in businesses. I do want to put that out to listeners, though. Like, we are early in our development and it's a very exciting time, but we need feedback too. So I'm open to feedback as part of this learning process because ultimately – you want to produce a product that's a benefit to your customers. If it's not a yeah. benefit to their customers, well, they're not going to use it and then you're not going to have the desired impact that you're after. So yeah. if I could say anything with this interview, it's that I'm very open to to feedback. You know, it's it, we've got a lot in the pipeline, but, you know, there might be suggestions or different ideas that are really, really, really important in this space. Yeah, absolutely. And the user the user experience and, and how, it, how it actually comes out in the wash, right? How it works when you're using it as part of the business is going yeah. to be key um, yeah. to the impact you guys can have. Is there anything else we've missed? We covered off, off the highlights? Mm, I think we're, I, I think that's, that's pretty good on impact. I feel like, um, y- you know, I, I said before, I've come from being a, a journalist so that the move towards selling is a new one for me. Yeah. And I, I'm talking to you now not from a sales perspective, but I'm com- acutely aware that we've just launched a product. So, therefore, you never stop selling when you're in business, do you? You can't. No. 
You just don't. <laughs> you don't. It's a natural. It's the. It's the. Uh, the part of the beast you just can't avoid. It's yeah. how it works. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I think anytime you've got passion and and real belief in the thing that you're ending, you're providing to the to the public or to business in this case, then the selling is much easier. Yes, I've got to it, say. Is. it is. It is. It, yeah, it becomes. Um, just verbal diarrhea. I'll, you yeah. can't stop talking about it. But you know, I love I love what I do. I love the impact that we've ha- we've been able to make through the the women's index. You know, that's a report that gets over a million eyeballs per quarter now on gender equality alone. And um, we don't do any paid media on that. That's just through circulation and the media picking it up and the interest in. Well, where do we stand on gender equality timeframes? We're at twenty four years on the gender pay gap. So. All these different things that we've been able to to track over the past six years have, have really um, spurred a fire in my belly, but just it keeps me going and have attracted a lot of really amazing people along for the ride as well. I, I'm grateful that I'm surrounded by a group of economists on the index who review that report every quarter um, that are just amazing. And there's been many before them too that have all contributed to where we're going with that report and the impact it has and then likewise with with yeah, impact, which is huge it's, and it's it's fantastic you know and and I think that's the power of when of when you make change in a business be it on DEI or maybe it's ESG it's really about bringing along um, a team with you that believe in that vision so you're in this infinite game not just this goal orientated business that has no real impact. And I think that's probably the the big thing with DEI and or gender equity, whatever part you want to focus on. Um, it's really about getting your employees living and breathing the change that you want to see and creating those cultures that truly benefit the business and make you feel like you want to be there and show up for your clients. And that your team believe that you believe in it yes. because you're doing something about it. Absolutely. The vision has got to be there. We've all got to have this vision of some sort that inspires. It just keeps you turning up. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Advice Explorers, if you'd like to find out more about Impactor, which I'm confident you will, or the Financy Women's Index, any of that information will include the website link in the episode show notes, along with Bianca's uh, LinkedIn details. I'm sure she can point you in the right direction of somebody that can then help you out if you're looking to get a demo or, or are interested in the tool. Look, thank you so much for joining us here today and sharing what is a bit of a different tech tool for the podcast. I was really excited to have you come on and share it with us and for finally to be live. I've been watching quietly stalking. Oh, thank you so outside. much. It's a delight to, to be talking with you again in this forum as well. Absolutely. And best of luck. And, you know, I'm excited we've now got a tool where business can actually make some change, you know, on diversity, equity and inclusion. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Lovely talk. So what a different one. I'm, I mean, I, I can't ask you, listener, whether you're a user of Impact because it's almost certainly not the case. This thing is only a month old. Um, but I am curious about your take on a tool like this. Um, and, you know, I'd love to hear from you on the Ensemble community platform on what your take is, whether you think that could apply to the practice you're in or the business you're in. Um, and, you know, It'd be interesting to hear, you know, the progress of any um, DEI strategies maybe you're seeing within the practice you're in, or if you do on your own, what your plans are in that space. In terms of my thoughts, what I thought it'd be worth doing is sort of giving us a baseline for this stuff that's um, maybe new to some people. Look, if you um, are maybe within product, you know, platform land or insurer land or large corporate land, then invariably, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion will have come up at something. You might have been to some training or aware of a department that looks after it within HR. Like there'll be something you've come across your radar. If like me, you're in a small practice, then it may, while you'll be aware of it out there, there'll be things you might see on LinkedIn about diversity. You might come across it at a conference. It's not necessarily something that we'd have a whole department, uh, you know, where it often is the practice. So what I wanted to just cover off is, you know, some baseline language that's used in that in that sort of environment because I think it can help us better understand the challenges we're facing and what we might be trying to embark on when we're talking about this space because I think it's easy when you're not 
immersed in it to dismiss a lot of the language is overthinking or really is it such a big deal? You know, I don't really see everybody has the same opportunities, don't they? It's all the same, right? Um, and I think, you know, when we think about it, you know, people feel, often feel like why you say about the investing space, like you talk about all this detail, really? Do I care? I don't want to know, you know, I just want to know that I've got enough money, right? We hear that from clients, right? And the truth is you need to know more to be able to understand how to better play in that space, how to better utilize it and engage with it. So just like we encourage our clients to better understand when it comes to investing, I think we individually need to better understand, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, so we can, we can see, um, how things can evolve and, and the impact it could have on our businesses, but also, you know, our skills and as an advisor. So in terms of the language, what I mean is it's just talking through the definition of different things. So let's talk about, you know, reality. Reality is, you know, generally, you know, one person or individual gets more than they need. You know, they might have a lot of opportunity and they might have a, you know, a lot of things at their disposal and somebody else gets less than they need. Um, and this is where disparity occurs, right? Um, whether that's on pay or opportunity or funding, you know, VC funding, all sorts of things, there's this difference, right? And somebody gets far more than they need. Somebody else can't get any, you know, that's where the frustration sits. Um, and, the often when we're not exposed to these things, we think, oh, well, what we're looking for is equality, right? And the reason I want to go through this language is it's not quite that actually. It's more, far, far, far more than that and, and, and has more layers than that. So I want you to imagine that there's, you know, a field, it's a children's playground, it's wonderful, it's got, it's got bubbles blowing, it's got balloons, it's got fun games and these kids are in there squealing, yeah. They're loving it. They're playing. And around this wonderful, fun-filled field is a fence. And on the outside of the fence are some kids sort of peering, trying to peer over. They can hear the fun being had. They're trying to peer over the fence. One kid looking over the fence is tall enough. They can see over the fence. You know, the next one can't quite, like his eyes peering just over the fence. And the next one can't even tell what's going on because it's not tall enough to see over the fence. It can just hear all the fun and the joy happening. Now, the thing about... And if you have that picture of those three kids, right, peering into all these things happening that they can't quite reach, then equality, the assumption behind equality is that any, everyone benefits from the same support. So in the in the little scenario I described, they'd all get a box so that they could stand on the box to be able to see over the fence, right? Now, the first kid didn't need it because he could already see over the fence, so he just gets a bit taller. The middle kid, yay, I can now see over the fence. This is great. I can see what's happening. The third kid, the box isn't big enough for them still for them to see over the fence, right? So an equal box for everybody, you know, equal treatment for everybody actually is, you know, that's equality. Whereas equity, everybody gets the support they need, right? So the kid that's tall enough, he doesn't need a box. You know, he's good. So he can see over the fence. The kid in the middle just needs the one box. It's all good, man. I'll just take the one box. Whereas the really tiny kid, he gets two boxes. He can finally see over the fence, right? So equity is when they get the support they need, not equality where they all get the same support. Now, and I'm sharing this only because this was um, this was insight I didn't have. And so when I was starting to do some digging into this as a topic, stepping through this, and I actually got it – a cartoon that a um, psychologist actually shared, and I'll share this on LinkedIn when we go live with the episode. It's really helped me understand what we're talking about here. Now, there's another layer, right? We can go further. Justice is when all three of the kids can see the game because the actual cause of the inequity has been addressed. It disappears, meaning the fence is gone. They can all see anyway right? So the actual, the barrier, the systemic barrier has been removed, right? So that's justice, right? So that's when, now that's a, that's a hard, that's a really hard thing to achieve because often those systemic barriers, when we're talking about, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, those things are things that have developed over time that often we've never been aware of that they exist, these barriers. So this is a very difficult thing to achieve. And this is an evolution, right? Of our approach. Um, but that's what justice is. Now, inclusion is even further because inclusion says, well, the kids shouldn't be standing on the edge looking in they get to be included in the fun that's being had. They get to play with the bubbles and they get to run around on all the great rides and, and squealing with happiness. You know, no one is left on the outside. You know, you don't only remove the barriers keeping people out. We actually make sure they're all valued and they're all involved, 
right? So that is sort of the layers of the things we're talking about here. And this applies, like I mentioned before, whether it's gender, ethnic background, age, um, physical ability, uh, you know, Indigenous Indigenous background, all these sort of things um, are a lens to each of those uh, sort of expressions I use there, you know, whether the reality, current reality, you know, focusing on equality, moving beyond that to equity, actually achieving justice for this issue, and then ultimately having full inclusion, right? So the reason I step through that is, um, you know, if that's sort of flagged for you, I'll hold on, my understanding isn't deep enough on this. I've been making some assumptions about what everybody means when they're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, then feel free to check out the LinkedIn post I've done to share the graphic. That alone got me a long way. And then start doing some digging. Now, as advisors, I think there's more to be asked of us. I mean, there's absolute need for things like Impactor in businesses we operate in. So I'd encourage you all to nudge your owner or your team leader or anybody like that and say, hey, do we have a tool like this? Can I, you know, I'd love to hear about what we're doing on this front. Absolutely. I'd encourage you to start asking and engaging on the topic. But we're advisors, we recommend investments. And for many of you listening, you have a passion and your clients have a passion about ESG. Now, we've all heard of things like like greenwashing and all those things when a fund misrepresents actually the process they go to, right? That's one thing. But I would suggest that if a fund manager is talking about, you know, applying a lens to the underlying funds or, or, or stocks, you know, equities that they invest our clients' money into, they also need to be talking internally about their own approaches to sustainability sorry <laughs> sustainability and governance to diversity equity inclusion you know that in their own business not just in where they put our clients money but in their own business what are they doing on this front and what can they share with us that we can share with clients because it I think we're going to evolve over time to the point where it's not going to be enough to know the underlying investment has that lens. The public are going to want to know that the person choosing those investments has that lens within the business they're working in, within that fund manager. So, you know, I'd encourage us to all start asking about that. Hey, what is your approach to DEI. Do you have a tool like Impactor that's showing, you know, a progression over time? We acknowledge financial services is way behind lots of other industries here, but hey, how are you going? What's the progress? So I guess, you know, I think us just asking the questions and asking this, you know, repeatedly, lots of us asking it, we'll start to see more and more of them actually prioritize this on the list of many things that they're trying to develop within their business. So I'm hoping that, you know, this maybe flags some interest for you, got you more curious. Maybe you're going to do some more reading or digging. I'd encourage you to follow Bianca and her work at Financy. Um, there's a lot of interesting reading there too. But this is this is so much, so much bigger than just, um, you know, about our teams. This is about the public we serve um, and making sure that, that we can put ourselves in their shoes, that we can – create, you know, get a lens of their lived experience that's much deeper than it otherwise would have been because we are opening our eyes to it for our own staff and therefore, you know, our ability to serve the public, I think, will be much better. Um, and, you know, the percent of advised Australians, I think, will increase as we can all better reflect them and and better empathise with where they are coming from. So, now, in the last few minutes, we've got... Um, you know, we all know that uh, I have a passion about curiosity. I believe the one skill we need to have to be truly bionic advisors is avid curiosity. So to help you build that habit, this week's today's Curiosity Corner website is a little bit of a gift. Um, I'm getting asked a lot about AI tools um, and there's only a bajillion of them. Uh, yes, technical expression there. Uh, I've got an actuarial background. I can say a bajillion is a real thing. Um, there's loads of them and they're just coming up all the time. Uh, and so people are like, oh, is there an AI tool for this? Oh, is there an AI tool for that? And the answer is, oh, I don't know. Uh, there might be, probably. Uh, and so I came across um, this website that I think could be really useful called futurepedia.io. That's future. P-E-D-I-A dot I-O. And very simply, this is an AI tools directory and they update it daily. 
And if you just head on it, you can, you know, that you can focus on tools that got added today, but you can also search for a particular category. Oh, I'm looking for something that does audio editing. I'm looking for something that builds avatars. I'm looking for something that's, you know, a customer support AI tool or a copywriting tool or an education assistant or, you know, an email assistant or it does fashion or it does fitness or like basically they've collected them all in one place and then they've also um, collated uh, sort of feedback on them so they're scored uh, and you can see all the different tools that are available or accessible to do all sorts of different things. So no longer will you have to wonder is there an AI tool for that task or is this, you know, that thing that I find frustrating, is there something I could use that could could help me along the way? Simply use uh, Futurepedia and I reckon that'll get you a long way in the right direction. Welp, that's all we've got for this week, folks. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice, tech fix, or to magically sent to you each Friday. Uh, and if you are stuck in a bit of a rut on process and tech projects going forward, or maybe even you're part of a group, you know, maybe a dealer group where it's like, oh, everybody's like, oh, far out tech, you know, this is a bit overwhelming. Should we, should we get new tech? Should we just focus on the ones we've got? Then I am um, doing a whole lot of um, keynotes and and workshops in the future about how we can become um, better, more tech savvy. We can make tech a key part of our infrastructure infrastructure in our practices um, and potentially how we can even streamline it and use use less of it in the future and just use it well. So if you would like me to come and talk at an event in the future or, you know, run a workshop for your practice, then please don't hesitate to reach out. I'd love to have a chat. Um, and you can find me on LinkedIn at Peter MD. That's P-E-I-T-A-M-D. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, Advice Explorers, stay curious. Thank <laughs> you.